Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Franz, music director of your Windsor Symphony Orchestra, and I am so excited to be talking today to my friend and the incredible composer, Eric Awazen. Eric, welcome to the Windsor Symphony Orchestra. I'm so delighted to be here and to get a chance to chat with you again. Robert, it's been a long time, and uh, uh, it's, I'm just so delighted you're playing my music again. Well, Eric, we ever since I first played the first piece I did of yours, The Shadow Catcher, about five or six years ago with a different orchestra, I've fallen in love with your music. And the piece that we're actually going to perform, the Symphony in Brass, is a piece that we've performed already in Windsor. We performed it for uh, uh, about three years ago for a few thousand high school students, and they loved your music. In fact, everybody loves your music, but particularly brass players. And it's funny, when I talk to my brass friends and they list sort of the major composers in history who they love, they usually start Mahler, then Bruckner, and then third in line is always Eric Oazen. And so- <laughs> I never heard that story, I love it. <laughs> well, my question to you is, talk to me about what it is with your fascination of brass instruments. You have written so much brass repertoire over the years. And brass players really do just like they worship the ground that you walk on. Tell me a little bit about your connection to brass instruments. Well, this started when I was a student at the Eastman School of Music, and they have a they've had a traditionally a great wind ensemble. And in fact, they they really uh, uh, helped put the idea of a wind ensemble on the map. And this was way back in the days of Frederick Fennell, who was the director. And so, consequently, there was a big brass department there and the Eastman Brass Quintet would perform. And what all of us composers notice is that these brass players were playing a lot of contemporary music. And, uh, um, and it was so intriguing. And then just the realization that pianists, they have a ton of music from the past, but the brass players don't have as much. And so it was simply a question that uh, um, I'm adding to the repertoire. And I love the sound, the brilliance, the, 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 the dynamic quality of the instruments. Um, so it's just been fun adding to their repertoire. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that it started for you in school. And I, I've noticed, I've noted uh, you've you've come from quite the lineage of teachers, Milton Babbitt, uh, Milton Babbitt, uh, Joseph Swantner, and I see that you've also studied with Gunther Schuller. And I don't know if you know this, but I actually was a student of Gunther Schuller's as well. Um, I was a conducting student of Gunther Schuller's, and and for those who don't know, Gunther Schuller uh, was such a force in the 20th century in American, not only composition but just the way that people think about music. Me that Beethoven and Brahms were not just names on a piece of paper, but actually a co composers. And when he got me inside of their heads, it changed everything about how I thought about those composers. I wonder if you might say a word or two about what what Gunther Schuller sort of meant to you, or what you experienced with him, or what that experience was like. He was such a character. Oh sure, <laughs> and but he was. I, I studied with him at uh, Tanglewood, and yes. he was. I mean, he was running the place because he was uh, uh, conducting the orchestra. Um, he worked with all of the composers and uh, was involved with chamber music. I mean, and uh, uh, he was inspiring, energetic. And uh, um, as, as you said, he really championed the idea of new music. And studying with him was wonderful. Um uh, what he really taught me was because uh, uh, it was only for a summer. So the focus was writing for the instruments to flatter the sounds of the instruments that you're writing for. And he really worked with me on that idea. And it's, uh, it's, it's so talking about brass, you know, to flatter the sound of uh, the brass. And so that's what he certainly uh, uh, inspired me to do. It's really interesting, isn't it? I think it's it's sometimes for people to understand that like when you're composing a piece of music, it's not just the sounds that you hear in your head, but you have to think about the instruments that you're writing for and what they can do well and what they can't do because no matter how good of an idea that you have in your head, it, it can't be executed by a musician on an instrument. It's never gonna come to life. I wonder if you can share with us a little bit of the inside of your head, Eric, and share with us a little of the compositional process for you. How does it, how do, where do these ideas come from? How does it start? How do you, how do you even sit down to a piece of paper and just start putting dots on the paper and music comes out? 
Well, I have to say I improvise a lot and I start, I use the piano for everything. I know, you know, it's, it, it is good to be able to just do things in your head, but no Beethoven here. If I lose my hearing, <laughs> I find another profession. <laughs> so I use the piano all the time. Everybody, whatever works for you, it works. And that's it. So I do a lot of improvisation and, um, I, I like to decide on a particular mood or feeling or inspiration. Shadow Catcher, for example, was based on uh, 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 photographs of the Native Americans. And uh, um, with the symphony in brass, that was there was no particular storyline. So I just wanted to create, well, the idea of brass one thing you think of is fanfares and excitement. And so I, I started the piece, you know, with, with the idea of, oh, not that, but something that it was a little bit more soft and lyrical. And then ultimately the fanfares come in. So it's kind of telling a story. Uh, um, but uh, as I said, uh, using, uh, you're telling, you're taking the listener on a journey and yes. you're telling them a sonic story story and they're feeling oh it's beautiful it's or oh it's riveting and it's it's as simple as that that's awesome so so then the the role of the audience really does play a huge part in your mind as you're composing i mean you are thinking i assume based on what you just said well how is someone receiving this music how does that fit into the equation Exactly. Uh, I always think about the listener, but you never know who the listener is because the listener could have had a lot of experience with contemporary music or maybe no experience. They may have never heard a brass quintet before or they're a brass player. So you just never know. Um, that's why I think it's a lot of times the strength of the melodies, the harmonies, things that appeal to me. I hope they appeal to others. And so I'll, I'll go about a little bit that way. But I do always think about the listener. Tell, talk to me a little bit, Eric, about, um, you know, we think, OK, so I'm, I'm imagining you now improvising at the piano and just being creative and just having just these incredible things come out of your mind and out of your fingers. But there is in every art form, but particularly in composition, a balance of discipline versus creativity. Uh, because it's because you can't just like I, I would assume just sit down once every seven months and improvise something and a magic piece comes out and boom, you're done. So what is that? How is that balance work? How do how do you think about like what is your discipline uh, structure to create music? Well, I with, with my own students, I think about this, well, the types of things that I encourage them to do, which is really know the music of the past and uh, so I'll look at the forms and structures of a Mozart, of a Beethoven. I'm going to compare this to painting because sometimes when you go to museums, you see students gathered in front of paintings and they're, you know, kind of drawing, imitating it. They notice the shape or whatever, and they're writing it down. Same thing with composers. We'll look at uh, 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 their forms and structures. A particularly favorite composer of mine, for example, is Brahms. And so I love his, uh, I'll, I'll say, sort of classical forms. Of course, he's a romantic composer, but he utilized the forms and structures of a Mozart and a Beethoven, and it, it's it's and we learn from that, and that presents uh, um, a structure of an opening. What happens in the middle? What happens in the end? Virtually all music. Now, oh boy, is that a dangerous thing to say? But <laughs> music, the majority, is like a circle. It yeah. kind of ends where it begins. There is that love of a return. It's like you go on a journey and you love to see some places and then you love to come home. And right. so that's that simple idea of uh, we, we call it in music a B A form or a sonata. Sure form, exposition, development, and recap, go back home. And so little uh, ideas like that, I do keep in mind. That's awesome. So, um, and then do you, uh, do you compose every day? Like do you, do you wake up every morning and have a certain time of day or a certain amount of time, or do you just compose when you're commissioned to compose? What is that process like for you? 
Well, I'm always writing. Yeah, the time is, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher, too, and yeah. I teach a lot. <laughs> and, uh, 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 and these days, of course, teaching virtually, but which also takes extra time. But uh, um, uh, what I do is uh, there's some times where I have to focus my energies on that. But so I compose any time, sometimes, you know, a lot of times in the evening. Uh, um, and I, I try, if possible, to have some moments devoted to my music uh, every day. And uh, and then there's times, for example, like over the summers, like right now, I can devote myself to uh, a lot of time to composing. And that's really nice. But I do love my teaching, so it's 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 kind of a balance that I put there. But uh, vacations are a big time that I can compose more. <laughs> Understood. I, I know I get that, and that's I think true for lots of performing musicians as well. There are times of the year where you get to sort of resettle down and sort of recalibrate and return to your roots, so that you can sort of find the energy to kind of move on. And and that's been that's been a challenge. Tell me, I know that you're based in a, a major US city that's been hit with COVID-19. Uh, tell me how that has changed things for you about the way you teach, the way you live, the way you're like, what has your experience been as a composer during this time? Well, New York City was hit. Yeah. You know, so hard and so quickly. Uh, and so suddenly, so we were in shock. And the opening weeks were frightening. Yeah. And so there was zero composing happening yeah. at that time. <laughs> it was too surreal. Your mind was in uh, just in another place. You know, I mean, days and days, you know, you just don't leave your, your uh, uh, um, I mean, apartment in, in, in the kind of in the middle of uh, the Upper West Side, Manhattan. But that's, you know, this is all the beating heart of New York City. And uh, to go outside when it's empty was so surreal. And so I say it was genuinely frightening. We were lucky in terms of we have a great uh, governor of our state and, and they and, 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 and the mayor as well, um, the, where, where they we, we just huddled down in our places. We did the social distance in day one. And of course, New York right now is in a good place. We don't know for now. For now, we don't yeah. know what's going to happen in the fall or whatever. We these of days course. we take it one day at a time, and uh, um, so with that idea in mind, you know, the more I got used to it. Oh, but then teaching came about right at right at the beginning as well. So this happened, and a week later, so, see, we were on initially spring break, and we had to go and teach, and so <laughs> and to do it virtually. I've never this our you know uh, our Skype is how we're doing yeah. this, and I. To, uh, I have some private students. Even now, I'm doing Skype every Saturday with my uh, 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 private students. But yes. uh, Zoom we use, you know, for the classes and learning how to do that at first when I've never done it before. And me and technology has not <laughs> always been <laughs> the nice. <laughs> well, learning. I mean, I remember one of the very first classes. You know, I, I, I started, I was, you know, I, I had wonderful colleagues at Juilliard that were helping me through that knew more about it. But, you know, 20 minutes into the class, somehow I evaporated the entire class. And oh, they were no. told, what do I do? And so now I'm trying to get back on. It took me about 25 minutes. And thankfully, about the about half the class hung in there. <laughs> I was so grateful. And, uh, but the, the, uh, I mean, there's nothing like face it with music. We want to be together. We want to, you know, but you had to learn a new kind of way of connecting, of timing, of what to point out, um, sharing my screen because I'm showing scores or playing excerpts of that, all that I'd have to, it, it took twice as much time or three times as much time of, of yeah. class preparation. I'd have to do run, dry run throughs of each class prior to the class, you know. So anyway, very difficult. But well, we did. It. I, yeah. And we've all I mean, it's amazing the changes that have occurred. And of course, at the Windsor Symphony Orchestra, we are now uh, in the throes of putting together our digital concert series, uh, Reimagine 2020. And so on that concert series, we are going to be performing your symphony and brass. Now, this is kind of coming home for this piece in a way because it was commissioned by the Detroit Chamberwinds who played it just right across the river from us. 
exactly. um, first. And uh, the piece we have performed as an orchestra a number of times, never in public, always for students. And we performed it for thousands of high school students who are ha- were and are enamored by the sounds and by the piece. So a couple of questions about the piece. First of all, the title. It's interesting because when we think of symphonies, we think of strings, woodwinds, brass, percussion. We think of four movements. We think of Papa Haydn. We think of Beethoven. We think of Brahms. Talk to me about the title Symphony in Brass and how you settled on that title. Okay. Well, the title originally I got inspired by Rhapsody in Blue. So from Rhapsody in Blue became Symphony in Brass. Oh, wow. Uh, Actually, uh, you mentioned Gunther Schuller. I believe his piece he has the Symphony for Brass, you know. And so, uh, um, so I wanted to do, uh, uh, you know, sort of the idea of the same thing. And when one thinks of symphony, and there I'm going to go again to the idea of classicism, a symphony using the, um, uh, uh, the sonata form, right? So the yeah. first movement does have that. It, 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 it there's a, a recap of, of, uh, uh, after the slow introduction of the, of the main material and then uh, um, a slow mo- second movement that's uh, um, a little bit more uh, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit uh, a freer form um, uh, but but it's it's has that nice contrasting sound and then what brass does best a fanfare <laughs> and so the third movement to have that and also to make that a little bit well, it's not really a rondo, but you do have an exact repetition of that, dum, ba, dum, bum, 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 and we have that coming in. So that's that's how that came about. Yeah, sure. So the work is in, as you mentioned, three movements, and it's written for uh, four trumpets, four French horns, three tenor trombones, one bass trombone, a euphonium, a tuba, and two percussionists. Uh, this is. This is, I would say, probably as close to a typical brass ensemble setup as there is. I mean, there may be slight alterations, but this is basically the format of that. Um, So what's interesting to me about a brass ensemble, much like a string orchestra piece, is that there's very homogenous sound quality, right? All the instruments make sound in the same way. And basically it's different timbres of, but the same sort of basic kind of sound. How do you... And your music is extraordinarily colorful and extraordinarily interesting as you listen to it. How do you find or create those colors in the music when you're writing for an ensemble that is very sort of homogenous in the sound? Exactly. Uh, uh, I'm going to go back to my phrase, flattering the sound of the instrument. I think a lot about articulation. Um, Me not being a brass player, never played a brass instrument in my life. I own a World War I bugle where once in a while I could play one note on it. It's this old beat up thing, you know, like something you'd see in a Woody Allen movie or something. (laughs) Yeah, I can't explain (laughs) <laughs> like he's pretending he played tro- anyway, uh, uh, but that's so I, I haven't played it. But I do. I study the repertoire. I study what you know. Uh, a little bit of everything. I, I look at uh, um, the uh, the older music, and I, I, I look at the Renaissance music. So that dum dum bum 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 bum, and then oh wow, and that's old English Renaissance music. Oh, I listen to a lot of that. Com- uh, uh, the composers from that period. You know, and uh, I just lo- uh, love that, you know, Thomas Tallis, all that, you know, that where they had that uh, um, uh, a particular sonority. And then also uh, um, then a little bit later, uh, a Haydn trumpet concerto or Mozart, uh, uh, the way he uses the, the brass in, in his orchestrations. But then. This is 20th century, you know. Uh, well, I guess not, it's 21st century, <laughs> but anyway. So, and then you listen to what the later composers did, and try to get a lot with the, a variety of articulation, dynamic variety, and so because it is a homogenous. Oh, also because I have the luxury of so many instruments, uh, sometimes full, sometimes there's duets or trios. Uh, sometimes it's almost like a concerto type of thing. One instrument is primary, so you change that as well interesting yeah well you can definitely hear that in the music and it's it's really like i said it's what's interesting to me about this piece and why it's one that i enjoy conducting and performing so much is that it has so much variety and it really speaks to the breadth of what 
you would imagine uh, a full symphony orchestra sounding like, but you get all of those colors and sounds in a, a symphony of brass and a couple of percussion. It's really extraordinary. Uh, last question for me. Sure. What was your first musical memory and or what was the first thing you remember writing down as a composer? Oh, sure. Well, it was thanks to um, teachers of mine. And just I, I, cello was the instrument that I play. I know piano is my main instrument, but I played cello. So the very first piece I ever wrote was a piece for cello and piano. And that was back in, I had a wonderful teacher, Mr. Uh, Ludwig. And uh, uh, um, he was the orchestra teacher and he, you know, conducted, but he you knows a pianist too. And so he went, oh, Eric, why don't you write something? And so I wrote this uh, piece for uh, uh, a cello and piano and uh oh i still have it somewhere there i have to take that out you know and, and uh, bring that out again and then uh little by little um again thanks to mr ludwig my very first orchestra piece was when i was a senior in high school boy these days as i said i'm a teacher we find, you may find that true. I mean, we think that it partly is because of these computers and stuff that musicians are now better than ever. They're more informed. They're, they know, you know, piano is playing a, a piano concerto. Oh, they can listen to Rubenstein. They can listen to yeah. you know, ever, you know, playing the, playing the works, you know. And uh, uh, um, the same thing with composers. They can hear all this music. We didn't quite have it then, you know. So um, anyway, but I do encourage, you know, people to, to listen to, to a lot of different music like that. Yeah. Well, Eric, it's been a delight talking to you, and I cannot wait until we get to perform and our audience gets to hear your symphony in brass so thank you so much i appreciate it thank you so much and it's a pleasure of getting to of get it's a pleasure to get together again even if it's virtually it's true <laughs> and we'll get together in real life before long yes. i'm sure well that would be great <laughs> i'll come up to windsor anytime you play my music very seriously love we'd love that we would love that 